YouTube. So with that, I'm going to officially start the panel. Welcome everyone. My name is Solimar Salas. I'm the Vice President for Museum Content and Programming at the Museum of Latin American Art. We welcome you today, Sunday, March 14th of 2021, to the Herland Women in the Mola Collection exhibition panel discussion. We are honored to have in today's panel five incredible women artists from across Latin America and Latinas from the US who are part of this exhibition curated by Gabriela Urtiaga, the MOLA chief curator. The selection of women artists that we present in this exhibition are part of the MOLA permanent collection. And by sharing them with our public, we begin a new approach to our history as an institution, broadening our perspective and delving into those works that speak of certain topics, many times invisible in the history of art, such as the creation of female artists. Mm. We thank the Dwight Stewart Youth Fund Rumba Foundation, Arts Council for Long Beach, and South California Edison for their constant support of the education programming at the Museum of Latin American Art. If you have not yet experienced the exhibition, we invite you to visit the virtual Herland exhibition on our website. When the museum is able to reopen, you will also be able to see the exhibition in one of our galleries at MOLA. With that, I am pleased to introduce you to the moderator for today's session, Shana Nies Dambrot. She is an art critic, curator, and author based in downtown LA. She is the arts editor for the LA Weekly and a contributor to Flaunt, Art and Cake, and Artillery. She studied art history at Vazar College, writes book and catalog essays, curates and juries exhibitions, is a dedicated Instagram photographer, and is the author of the experimental novella, Send Psychosis, published in 2020 by Griffith Moon. She speaks at galleries, schools, and cultural institutions nationally, and is a member of Art Table and the LA Press Club. She is a member of the boards of Art Chair LA and the Venice Institute of Contemporary Art, the Advisory Council of Building Bridges, Art Exchange, and the Brain Trust of Some Serious Business. Thank you, Shana, for hosting today's panel. And again, a very generous a thank you to all of you for being part of this program. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Solimar. Wow. First of all, sorry for the long bio, like note to self. I'll cut that. I'll make that shorter uh, next time. It, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. And honestly, yes, I have questions and I've been thinking a lot about the way that the conversation can go today, but mostly, and I think like everyone in the audience, I'm personally just so excited to have these incredible women assembled. And I just feel really lucky that we are able to, and I'll let everyone tell you where they're beaming in from, but when I tell you it's intercontinental uh, today, the women are here from literally, you know, all across the Western hemisphere and it's really, and right down the street. And that is so exciting. And I think in some way kind of leads into the conversation that we're gonna be having. So just to give everybody like the lay of the land, we're gonna go down, you know, the row um, and have each woman introduce themselves and speak a little bit about, you know, their practice and their background in a general way. Um, and images will be shared at that time. So we can all get sort of oriented. And then we'll come back and we'll have a, a broader ranging conversation, um, you know, unpacking some of the issues and pulling on some of the threads um, that come up within their practices and also in the context of this exhibition happening now at this particular institution in Women's History Month and what, what all of those things are like um, and how all of those kinds of issues function in the work and in the careers and lives of these incredible women. Um, and then at the end, there will be time for questions from the audience. Um, I think you can, there's a Q and A button at the bottom of the Zoom, um, which might be a lovely place to ask your questions or if there's a chat uh, feature and then we'll come back and there will be time for that at the end, just to let everyone know. So um, with that, before we start unpacking all these complex ideas about art history and, um, you know, the, the art and literature of all of so many different kinds of threads and legacies across the diaspora, the Latin American universe and diaspora. Um, before we get into how being a woman um, 
and your identity and lived experiences might interact with your broader sense of art history and influences before we get into all of that yummy stuff later. First, I want to just give everyone a chance um, to introduce themselves and speak a little bit about what goes on in their practice. And just arbitrarily, I'm just going to go in the same order that's on the banner. Um, and so I think that that is, um, means that we are going to start, yes, with Amalia Caputo. And so welcome to the stage. Uh, please introduce yourself to let us know where you're beaming, calling in from today, and tell us a little bit about the work that we're seeing. Well, hi, everybody. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be surrounded by such amazing, amazing women artists and art historians and at the MOLA. And um, so my name is Amalia Caputo. I currently live in Miami. I was born in Venezuela from an American mother and Italian father. So I'm one of those hybrids that are so common in this uh, continent. Um, and I live and work in Miami since 2003. I left Venezuela in 1992 and I was not able to go back because of the political situation that we, most of us are familiar with. Um, but I'm very happy and I consider Miami home at the moment. Um, so the work that you're seeing here uh, is uh, one of my, uh, from a series I made in 2007. It, um, it's called, it's from the Heroine series. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's questioning um, some kind of roles of domesticity or the notion of the ambivalent notion of freedom. Who is freer, the bird, the plastic bird or the woman in the cage? I, I deal with a lot of stereotypes uh, in my practice that have been you know, very common to women artists and uh, in women in general, of course. Uh, I question the notions of domesticity, of motherhood, of liberty, freedom of speech, freedom in general. Uh, my practice is connected to basically photography, video, and installation. I, uh, I question, um, in my practice, I also question the role of photography as a constructor of memories. So basically, I try to um, weave through uh, the notions of the feminine. I work also a lot with the, the natural world. I work with art history and with photography itself. So in this, this series, this is one of five in which a woman is holding or interrelating with a domestic object. In this case, it's a cage and it's, it's quite probably the most obvious one, but the series was thinking about how we envision domesticity and how every woman in their, in their world is a hero of their specific reality, even though Sometimes they don't have the, leap, the freedom to actually express it or uh, live it, you know, but they have a mentally a very profound internal uh, dialogue that enables them to be free wherever they are, even if it's in a cage, uh, even if, if it's the most literal of all the closures. So this is the work that I'm showing here in Herland, and uh, my practice has uh, shifted from uh, making and constructing work that is very oriented towards art history and the representation of women throughout art history, and also uh, constructing images that are work as metaphors for ideas concerning uh, womanhood and our roles in society and our voice in society. And I also uh, I'm shifting towards also creating large visual atlas because I want to have that feeling of seeing it all at the same time and, and grasping an idea and not just the single image because we live in such a profuse world now where we see very ephemeral works. I'm dealing a lot with uh, this uh, idea of what happens when we face the whole, you know, wall or the whole room with all these images. So how do we live with them? So basically that's how my practice evolves. I have been 
doing photography since 1989. I am an art historian from Universidad Central de Venezuela, and I did my master's in New York. And um, I am a current resident artist at the Deering Estate, which is a, a very beautiful uh, place in South Florida. If you ever come, they have a great resident artist program, and I'm lucky to be there. I also have my studio at the Big House Art Complex, and that's me. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And it's, you know, whatever. As we go down and meet everyone, I think that um, along with myself, the audience will start to understand how magic, how much magic there is in this assembly today. Because um, I can see even the other artists already sort of nodding as you're talking, going, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Oh, yeah. And so I see, you know, the women inspiring each other, like even right now. And I'm just, I'm so excited for the whole thing to, to happen. Um, okay. Thank you for that. We'll be back. Um, Leila Cardenas is next. And please introduce yourself and tell us um, where you're calling from and tell us your story. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, currently in Bogota, Colombia, where I live and work most of the time. Do you hear me well? Sorry. Yes. Just double checking. Okay. Good. Um, um, I like to think of myself as a sculptor, uh, but I do a lot of work that is mixed media, video, photography, drawing. Lately, I've been dealing a lot with uh, the undone in textiles. So uh, I think I like to see this image in the background because it's a premonition of the work I'm doing lately. But uh, actually, that work is from 2002, I think. And it's called um, Casa de Casas. Uh, it's a house of houses. Um, and it's a drawing based on a photograph. I was uh, collecting, collecting, it's a way of calling it, it's a, a, like recording uh, ruins of uh, old places, specifically domestic spaces. I, I was more interested in the uh, domestic ruin that uh, was in the city or around in, in the countryside, but near the city. Like you could tell that there was a, a problem with a dream not, not achieved, no? like this dream of modernity that is, uh, surrounds our countries. And um, it's a drawing that has many layers. I, I started to work with layers and to understand the work, uh, to, to understand the world in terms of layers. And I, and I guess one of the clues started when I was living in Los Angeles because I went to school there, uh, to UCLA. Uh, and basically uh, the city was uh, a complicated space for someone dealing with history, memory, ruins. Uh, and, and, and the lesson was to, to start really uh, looking for this uh, past uh, in, in layers, in uh, like uh, peeling away layers of architecture or, or walls or whatever surface that will give me clues of, of what was there before. And it become a methodology of, of work, but also uh, conceptually, it's very interesting. You start undoing, no? like taking away, peeling apart meanings, layers, symbols, to see what's there, what was there left. The, the, the bones, the structure, the skeleton. And somehow this house is that, that silhouette is that uh, barely standing there. No? The lines are also all trembling. And it's also, uh, I mean, the section of the exhibition called distortion or distorted, I think. And I, and I really like it because, um, because it's, it's, a, it's a statement, no? This, this panel today um, is bringing together voices that are uh, going against the linearity of, of, uh, of a narrative, breaking it and, and distorting it and giving it new meanings, new ways of understanding the reality. So that's my work. 
undo- undoing things, uh, peeling apart and uh, excavating for meaning amongst the layers of, of history. I, I hope I was clear. Sorry about <laughs> my English. <laughs> oh, no, first of all, I mean, yes, don't even worry about that. And I was going to say, you know, um, I don't speak, I, well, I don't speak Spanish, but I, I, I understand, you know what I mean? So, and I'm sure that that's a similar situ- situation. So also, if any of you just like get to a moment where you would rather say it in Spanish, I think obviously just go for it. Like, you know like just go for it make yourself heard um no I think that you know that's fine (laughs) um I think there's no absolutely no issues with that whatsoever the most important thing is that you say what you want you know said about your work um language is secondary uh thank you for that and I love what you said too and we're going to definitely come back to this idea of like a dream of modernity that maybe is not quite realized and what that is, because I think that that um, is part of the Los Angeles experiment in some ways as well. Um, and so that if that really resonated um, with me as someone who's been living here. So yeah, no, thank you for that. It's a beautiful piece. Um, up next, Sandra Ramos, please introduce yourself. And tell us your story. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Shana, uh, and thank you to the, to Mola for inviting me to be part of this wonderful group of women. Uh, and thanks to the audience that is uh, looking this in, in Zoom or, or in YouTube. Uh, my name is Sandra Ramos. I am an artist uh, from Cuba. I moved to Miami in 2014 with my daughter and my actual partner. And uh, I start my, my develop as an artist since um, middle eighties in Cuba when I studied at San Alejandro Art Academy and later on the higher Institute of Art in Havana. And I think uh, eight, late eighties and nineties were very important moment in Cuban visual art. Uh, uh, artists were very uh, active in the society and have a very important role, uh, mostly after the fall of Russia and, uh, and um, European so- socialist uh, uh, system, when Cuba in, in what we call the special period and all of, of that, that were studied at, at the art school uh, need to approach to society and what was happening in a different way. That's why my work always have to do with with these main subjects like that are politics, or how politics influence individual, how society uh, change or not as regard of the action of artists and how, how migration is also a very important part of, of the life of every Cuban and many of Latin American uh, men and women. And uh, this piece that is, that, we are looking here, uh, it's part of a portfolio that was a very beautiful project that we did start in 1999 uh, for artists in Havana, uh, Belkis Ayon, Ibrahim Miranda, Abel Barroso and, and me. We start this project uh, titled La Huella Multiple, the multiple print in which we made like, each two years a big uh, exhibition of Cubans and we buy some foreign also artists who deal with multiple work. It could be photograph, it could be prints, it could be video. And then we produce these portfolios that were like books that have one piece of each of the artists, usually like 50 artists. Uh, and we sold these portfolios to uh, um, found the next project two years later. Uh, the importance of this project is that that was made only by artists and financed by artists. That was, uh, we, we are at that time in Cuba was um, trying to create a different cultural uh, background uh, and that not deal so much with institution. And I think that's very important too, how artists in Cuba and mainly woman artists has been very important to create new cultural approach and new cultural space 
for instance, since the beginning of since the since the since 60s, um, Antonia Riz was one of the main artists that create a, in in her neighborhood a, a, a little school for children to separate from the official government galleries and, and places to show. Then we have like the example of like of Tania Bruguera, who has been so important for for the. Uh, uh, Activism, activism in Cuba, uh, and also Sandra Ceballos, who was the woman who created the first uh, non-official gallery in Havana in, in, at the beginning of the 90s. And she has been developed a big program since that. And specifically this work uh, was part of the series uh, titled The Impossibility of Catching Image, in which I, I work with, with Seal Screen. And, it's related to immigration. I used to work at that time. It's a piece from 1999, I think. A lot with the symbolism of the suitcases, also aquariums and, and trunks, and all elements that deal with the, the crisis of the crisis of the rafters and all the Cuban people that died crossing the Florida stretch. Beautiful, thank you. God, I can already see, I mean, yeah, my mind is sort of pinging, I'm just listening. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I really love um, the differences and commonalities that are already emerging um, between you. And, and I think this is gonna be wonderful. So um, please come on up, Veronica Rydell, and explain yourself to the listeners. <laughs> okay, hello. Thank you so much for having me here and sharing with you all. Um, I am from Guatemala. I live in Guatemala mostly. My name is Veronica Riedel, as you said. I am an artist, a photographer, a mixed media artist, video artist, and a filmmaker, a writer and a filmmaker. I've been working in photography and mixing photography in different media for a long time. Um, this spe specific piece that you see here is a series called The Making of a Mestiza. And what it is, is that everybody in Latin America has seen the colonial times through the eyes of men. I collected and in, did an investigation for three years of all the stories that I could find about women. Everything was told by men, obviously. Um, but I collected this 15 stories that were similar. So I decided to do a story for each story. And I came up with the faces of the story. This is one of them. Um, she is the first image that I chose and she's a queen. What it is, is that women were kept captives or married or kept slaves. And they, we saw and we know all of the Latin American women as in a point of view as being the submissive. And actually I came up with this idea that if I would be there and I would have the mind of the 20th century, why would I think in this was done to me? So I did these stories and they ended up being uh, one liners or three liners about this is me and I'm not choosing this, but this is my fate. Um, the captain is um, having me captive, but I am, I am being made his girlfriend and I feel like a queen taking, taking a step in my empowerment. I mean, it's too long to tell you all the stories I have them here, but what it is, is to see these women as queens, as empowered women. So the whole collection, has these women that we see them as the women that lost, they became in my work, the queens. And actually they are the mothers of all Latin Americans. So we should see them as queens. So in my reality, they are great women that need to be acknowledged at, with, with, with the wisdom they bring to us. And uh, since I, live in Central America, which is a very male-oriented society, this project was hard to pitch here. 
With the lack of curators and this male-oriented everything, 15 years ago, I came up with this and I pitched it and they were like, whoa, you talk about violence. And I'm like, no, I'm talking about reality. I mean, this is all history. I took the liberty as an artist to take their, their customs or the indigenous customs of, and this is not only a Guatemalan um, work, it's of all Latin America. And I embroidered um, language of everything that I collected that was from different cultures because this is a hybrid. So I did all these pieces. There were 45 pieces with different embroideries and they had silver and plastic um, metal things that I collected everywhere. So the language was like a, a specific language, but what it came through here was like, oh my God, this is a, a female project. Nobody will see it. And I traveled to Miami and Bernice Steinbaum, this wonderful, amazing woman, if you know her, she was like, I love this project. So we did this exhibition and it was really, really marvelous. And um, this 15 years ago, I've been traveling and I've been, you know, I'm so proud to be in this collection really. And it, um, some of the pieces have been collected in the whole world. And I watched through these 15 years, how people started warming up to this project. And they were like, oh, now I see it different. And since the, let's say the Me Too, that started in LA and because I'm a filmmaker, I was also doing like video art and movies about that. I saw all this attitude from people going like, okay, I'm gonna listen to this again. Oh, now I understand. So it's been wonderful how year after year, after these 15 years, the world has been opening to our project. And it's not like the empowerment of the woman, it's really regaining our place in the world, which is wonderful in this collective. Now, my work now um, is more ecological and like eco-feminist because I compared this ignorance for um, respecting the earth and the world. It's like the respect and ignorance about knowing a woman and what we can heal and what we can give. So my work now is this eco-feminist and sometimes it's about the geography of the world and how if we don't take care of it, we're gonna go kaput. And so I'm, I'm loving my work now because it's like I'm, I'm working with mycelium, like all this connective, um, connective mushrooms, I would say, but no, fungi, um, collective fungi that help. If a tree is dying, this other tree helps him. And I think this is the only way we can save the world. And this is part of us women. I mean, we are starting to be noticed, noticed like, hey, I should have women in my my um, equipo, my uh, team, because then we're going to be better. So I think uh, that this is a wonderful time for us and I'm really excited for what's coming up. Thank you, that is amazing. Yeah, I, and, and I think that's true. And I think one thing that's already emerging at, at this sort of intersections that we're operating at today, um, quickly before we get to, to my friend Linda, is that, you know, and I, I sort of express, this is my thesis going into today, is that, well, on the one hand, it's worth taking apart this idea that Latin American art is somehow a monolithic thing when of course it's an entire universe yeah. with all of the aspects and it's more, it's a multiverse. And so to take that idea of, you know, the monolithic thing apart, but at the same time to come to understand that it's perhaps the experiences of women in the world that actually is where some of the commonalities are, are, are will be found in this conversation today. And I just, as a you know, as an art writer and you know, art historian, art critic, I, I find that sort of script flipping, if you will, really um, inspirational. And that idea that you know we can both pull apart and celebrate like the diversities of our influences while at the same time achieving. A commonality of experiences and I think that that is so powerful and that is exactly the kind of opportunity 
that um, a show like this, you know, is specifically provides. So it's just like, thank all of you so much. I'm so excited about this already. Um, last, but oh my God, certainly not least, my friend and yours, the one and only Linda Vallejo is here to drop some wisdom. And um, there's so many projects um, with Linda that have their own uh, sort of silos of meaning and approaches and materials, but, you know, make them all Mexican. I'm sorry. It's always going to be everybody's favorite because it is just Crazy. so perfect. It's so moving. It's so funny. It's so witty. It's so smart conceptually. And, you know, you know, people just are never going to let this go. So <laughs> this is the right. And just embrace it. So this is um, a piece from that um, world of an ongoing um, series. And please, Linda, uh, mm -hmm. tell us your story. Thank you, Shana G. I really appreciate that introduction. Very kind of you. It's wonderful to be here with everyone. Thank you, Shana. Thank you to Mola. I'm really appreciative to be in such a good circle and such a beautiful uh, online exhibition. I can't wait to see it live because that's coming up any day. Uh, before I continue, can I ask you, Jorge, is it possible to see the backside of this image as well? Um, um, yes, I can. Give me yes. one second. That's fine. I'll start talking and maybe you can pop it up so we can see one side of her here. So uh, as Shana told us, uh, this is uh, a part of a series called Make Them All Mexican. And uh, basically for the last 10 years, I've been um, working on the idea of repurposing pre-made object or pre-produced object. And I scour antique malls in the United States uh, and uh, secondhand stores in the United States and also the internet for uh, reproductions that I can afford. And then I paint their skin brown to turn history uh, on its head, to turn culture on its head and to talk about, to begin discussions about the politics of color and class, culture, power, status, equity, access, in the United States. Uh, the reason why I asked uh, Jorge to show us the back side of this because this piece was actually produced this year. There we go. It's actually a data piece because after I painted about 200 of these make them all Mexican objects ranging from uh, pilgrim salt and pepper shakers, uh, making them brown because who invited who to dinner anyway uh, to Marie Antoinette and Louis Auguste to all of the presidents and all of the movie stars and uh, all of American cartoon figures, everyone became brown, everyone became Mexican like me. I made it make them all Mexican because I'm a Mexican, a Mexican American, uh, born in Los Angeles and uh, living here now for the last 40 years. Uh, before that, traveling a great deal through Latin America, Canada and Europe and the United States. And it just seemed like a nice palindrome, M-E-A-M, -E make them all Mexican, just seemed perfect. And so it was also important for me to go from what I know you know, what I've experienced, what, me, what is meaningful to me as a US Latina. So as a data piece, this particular piece has a tattoo on her back. She's obviously a, a Grecian a goddess uh, of some type, some, some beauty of the Grecian world. And the circle on her back is hand-drawn and it contains 31 spaces. Uh, this piece is called in 2010 through 2015, U.S. Latino college graduates grew by 40.8%, I'm sorry, 40.6%. So there's 31 spaces in this drawn mandalic form on the back, on her back. And if you multiply that by 40.6%, you come up with 13 painted spaces. So I've been doing a series of geometric and figurative based data works um, where I uh, place brown dots on architectural grid paper that actually signify US Latino data. Interestingly enough, uh, data about Latin Americans is growing because the Pew Charitable Trust in the United States has been doing the Latino initiative for the last, uh, I think it's been since 2013. It's a beautiful initiative that really shares a lot of the great details about who Latinos are in the United States. The Latino aspect about it is not make them all Mexican, it's not the Mexican data, it's about Latinos from all over the world who are now living in the United States, what their occupations are, their education uh, status, uh, what their professions are, their income levels, their poverty levels, any number of things, including recent data about uh, COVID and how the Latino population in the United States, the essential workers 
are really at the forefront of the, the death numbers, as we're going to see pretty quickly when the census comes out and additional data comes out. I tell people that uh, it's important for Latinos in the United States to know who we are, because a lot of the data, some of the data is good. Uh, over 60% of all US uh, business, women-owned businesses are Latina. Um, many people don't realize that we actually have a very strong entrepreneurship uh, uh, understanding of the world and that we like business, we like to have businesses. So there's good data, what I call good data or nice data and not so nice data so that we can get to know ourselves and also to help other people see who we truly are rather than making up information, making up data about us. So uh, in conversations about this work, you know, you can imagine my last show had 125 pieces at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes in Los Angeles. And uh, I think about uh, all, I don't know, half of it was make them all Mexican, which are all these forms painted brown. And the conversations and the panels that come up are generally uh, conversations about uh, what it means to be a person of color in the United States. What actually happens to a person uh, who is of color in the United States? Uh, how, um, how they suffer from prejudices, how they feel about being brown, if they've ever felt prejudiced against as being brown. <clears throat> and a lot of times, you know, people come to the panels and they, they're, they're either laughing out loud or they get angry because they have that kind of stuff going on or they, get, they start crying. And the panels are just really filled with a lot of personal stories about the politics of color and class in the United States. We've been going through a lot in the United States uh, of, from a feminist point of view, but also just as a community point of view for many, for many decades, for a couple centuries here now. And um, having a vehicle, an art vehicle that allows people to open up and actually speak about their experiences is, is something that uh, uh, exhibition spaces and curators and historians really love because it's socio-political and it, it's funny. A lot of people just start cracking up. You know, when you see uh, Barney Rubble and Fred Flintstone painted brown, you can't help but laugh. I mean, I do. And I have a lot of jokes about it. Elvis Presley's brown and he's kind of cute. And I, you know, he looks really good as a brown guy. It's kind of, kind of, it mixes humor with this whole attitude. I have, um, I've been doing this work since 2010. I've been really fortunate to have several shows of it and to be published widely with it uh, because I think it opens up a very, uh, a, what could be a difficult conversation, but it opens it up easily and invites people in in a way that makes it possible to talk about, uh, uh, you know, issues that aren't often spoken about, just like the feminist things that we were, that I was listening to a few moments ago. You finally get to talk about it. I'm looking forward to a solo exhibition at MOLA in 2022, and I'm producing a series of objects based around the politics of power and the question of where were Latinos uh, at the turn of the century, the turn of the, 20, the turn of the 20th century, where were we, and what was our uh, contribution to the making of America and the history of, of uh, the American culture and the American economy. Uh, right now, just to let you in on a little bit of data, uh, US Latinos constitute the seventh largest economy in the world. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing. But this is the kind of data people don't know about this. They don't see us like this. They don't see us as an, an economic po a power. Even though you know, we don't, we, uh, our income levels are, are lower we still spend a great deal of money on our families, and uh, what, we're 25. We're we're 24 percent of moviegoers before COVID, of course. Right now, we constitute 17 percent of the population, and in 2050, we'll be 30 percent of the population. With many people coming from Central and South America as well, not so much from Mexico anymore, interestingly enough. So I'm really looking forward to continuing the work. Um, the Brown conversation just seems to be something that comes natural to me after about 40 years of being involved in US, Latino, Chicano and indigenous communities. And I'm enjoying it a great deal and uh, buying a lot of antiques right now. Well, there you have it. Awesome, I love that. And you know, thank you, thank you everyone. And, and that that's actually a super perfect because I feel that um, you know, your relationship to um, imparting sort of, you know, education about the reality of the community. I think that um, that there's a really interesting dynamic in this idea. And I think each one of you has some version of that dynamic going on. In other words, here is a difficult history. Here is a past with a lot of layers and a lot of 
beauty and ugliness and a lot of stories that have never been properly told. And then the desire to access and express and educate those things within your work, but you're artists, right? You're not doing, um, you know, pr professor studies with that data charts. I mean, Linda, even when you do make a data chart, you make it in this mandalic, beautiful design with incredible materials. So the point is that you're all taking these realities and translating them through different mechanisms into something that makes it accessible and, in, you know, I don't want to say enjoyable because a lot of the work is that is unsettling as well. But, you know, when you present it in, you know, visual art, especially, I think all of you share some degree of, an, of relationship with, you know, strategies of surrealism where, you know, it's clear you're, you're encountering the information as a metaphor. And like, I think that makes the viewers um, able to enter the work because it's all, it's very um, evocative and it has an emotional component and a, these archetypes, you know, from the body and nature, the symbolism from a bird cage to, you know, a, a, a Greek, you know, a statuette to just, you know, the hand, the fish, the body, all of the ways that the imagery that you're all, you know, the, the house, all of those things are sort of shared. Um, uh, there's a shared understanding of what those symbols can mean. And now the viewer is in the work and then you can deliver to them the message that you have for them because they're already inside the work from its beauty and poetry. And I think that that, um, is a really effective sort of strategy um, for making work that um, that touches on those things. And I guess if I had a question to sort of start again from the top or really anyone who wants to jump in um, at any point, um, my question would be how, um, how sort of deliberate that is. Like in other words, when you're working with these narratives, and, you know, like Veronica was saying, I have this almost agenda, like there's a set of stories that haven't been told and I want to figure out how to tell them. This is what I'm going to do. And similarly with Linda, whereas with, with Amalia and Layla and even Sandra, it seems, you know, like that is also true, but it's maybe more personal as well as looking at societal dynamics. And so, um, I'd love to just get a sense from each of you how, how purposeful um, having your identity as a Latina, as a Latina, but meaning both a Latin American person and a woman, how those things um, exist in your consciousness as you're setting out to create a piece or a series. And if, if one of you doesn't volunteer, there we go, Veronica, excellent. For me, um, since I'm 13 years old, um, I've been dealing with the feminine. I'm the daughter of a Chilean European man, a German man, and married um, to a Guatemalan woman. And I've had the privilege and the liberty and the freedom to think differently in the society, but the society and the school I grew up, it just gets you caught up. So I've been living with this injustice all my life and I do have an agenda. I need, but I need, and I get really uh, to tell this in everything I do, it's definitely, I work with different mediums, could be this, and then suddenly you see a video art that has nothing to do with the mestiza, but behind is that justice that um, there has to be a justice in life in general. And more, the justice comes from looking at it in a different perspective, but actually educating the male heir. You know what I mean? That you need to, and it's not like didactic or like being a professor, but you really have to find a way in a subliminal or metaphoric or poetic way 
and how a man can say, Ooh, I've never seen this in this way. What is she talking about? And at first it might be like, Ooh, I don't want to see it. Like I proposed this series and they're like, not yet, because in my company, you cannot talk about violence. And so all these projects, um, I definitely have an agenda, but I have to be really poetical about going to them. You're right. Thank you. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, and, I, and I love that. And I think, you know, that's, thank you for that too, because that's sort of an added dimension to the same, to the question, which is, and how much of that is just because of who you are as a person and an artist versus how much of that deliberateness um, and strategy has to come from the political context of the place where you're actually working. So sort of the same question from the other side. So um, who else wants to go there? Um, um, Amalia, excellent, yes. thank you. I would just like to um, just tell a little story. Uh, when I was, well, I, I lived uh, most of my young life in Caracas and I studied there at the university. And when I was, um, considering my thesis for to graduate, uh, I presented this project that was the feminine in the works of Frida Kahlo, Tarsila do Amaral, Amelia Peláez, and Marisol Escobar. I had chosen uh, four decades uh, and four different women that worked in four different languages. And I got rejected that thesis because they said that the feminine was nothing to be studied. Oof. And that was early in the 80s. And I was, I was like, I, I did not understand. So I had to present a new proposal for my thesis, and which in which I had to compare the work of those women formally into the works of their masculine peers within the context of the modern um, languages or discourses that they were dealing with, such as surrealism in the case of Frida Kahlo, which now we, we know, we know better, and uh, cubism in case of Amelia Peláez, and pop art with Marisol, and Tarsila Amaral with Bra Brazilian modernism. So from the early beginning in my career, I have faced once and again, this idea of unexistence, of invisibility, and it's actually something that I have dealt with uh, symbolically, poetically, narratively, like any possible way. I make sure that in my work, whether it's uh, like whatever I'm dealing with at the moment in the process of my work, I make sure that I make very clear that this is coming from a woman that is saying things to the world in whatever way. Um, I think that being a woman that is underrepresented and that has been historically underrepresented and um, silenced by the art system. And uh, yes, we become angry and we become, you know, I want to have a loud voice. I want, even though the system still makes us invisible and still, uh, you know, they make us feel that any achievement it's because we had luck or, um, you know, we often, many women that I know suffer of imposter syndrome because they don't feel good enough or they don't feel, that their work is, you know, so important. And uh, everything we do as women is under scrutiny, whether you decide to have children or not have children or uh, dye your hair or not dye your hair or be an artist or not be an artist, like we're under scrutiny permanently from society. And this scrutiny was not invented by us. So I think that we do have to shift. And uh, even though any image that we build or murals that we do will not be able to represent the experience of being a woman. I think that, um, you know, the labor of being a woman is important. The psyche of being a woman needs to be spoken. And I think that we're lucky enough to have the medium to do that. Yeah, thank you. That is, I mean, that's a cry to action right there. And I, I feel you. And I mean, and I think that that's probably one of the reasons too that, you know, people see a work like with this cage and you know the plastic birds who have more freedom than the living woman inside of it is you know there's a there's a, a sort of gasp of recognition of like any woman anywhere in the world would see that image and know exactly what you're talking about and that's not even i mean it is a complaint but just to say that it that there's a recognition that transcends a lot of the context um, and I think that that's true of um, the symbolism in all of your work. And I don't think that that is a coincidence. So 
So there's a lot of power in that and um, in that sort of communication across languages, societies, eras, nations, you know, mediums, etc. Uh, and I think it's just it's just one more reason why this is the right this is the perfect exhibition to be discussing um, at this time. So I'm just, once again, so happy to be having this. I kind of wish that I was in the audience so I could just <laughs> listen to you. Um, God, thank you all so much. Who, who wants to have this part of the conversation next? Sandra, excellent, fantastic. Yeah. I think in my work is also very deliberated the choosing of a girl and a, a woman as a character that I have been using since 2000, not since 1993, that to represent all Cuban people in general. And why I choose a woman to fight against this political power, I think in some way, because uh, I think women have, women and children have this natural capacity to, to be resilient and to overcome all the difficulties. And for me, it was very important to create this alter ego that in some way represent all, Q all the Cubans born after the revolution uh, and that chose the contradictions inside the, the society and the construction of this utopia Cuban society that we were teach uh, to hope for. And also, I think my work is very narrative. I have all this uh, coming from all this storytelling and all these anecdotes that, that came from, from people around and from what happened in everyday life. And also it's very based in literature and poetry. Uh, one of, of the poems that more, most influenced my work, I think, are from, from Dulce Maria Loinas, Cuban poetry that made this series of poems titled The Iceland Creature, in which she tried to define how, how would be a, a, a person that born in, in, an, in an island different from the person that born in a continent. And so I think this kind of base that I have in my work also in relation to emigration and in relation to, to trying to transmit, transmit from a character that is a girl all the situation of Cuba recent uh, history. Thank you. I mean, and yeah, I mean, just, you know, the ring is sort of one of the, the <laughs> ways that you know it's a, a woman, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when looking at the hand, okay, it's, it's small, you know, it's, it's, it's not like just a pretty hand. So you could figure out that it's a woman, but I think the presence of the wedding ring, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, further sort of signifies something about the so the social role and it's like you know I'm 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 making this offering to you it's life it's you know it's all of the, it, it, it's mother ocean it's all of those roles yeah and also women I think are the most that suffer during the immigration process women and, and children also are the, are the major victims even in, in Cuba, that is the, the, this process happened through the sea. It's very dangerous for, for, for women and children. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Layla or Linda, who, Linda, Linda and then Layla, and then we'll talk again. Awesome. I just, I, I, I had the thought and I didn't want to lose it. So um, my work is, has a very strange aspect of, um, chance involved in it. Uh, I don't give intention to my work. Audiences give intention to my work. And oddly enough, this very strange thing uh, called shopping gives intention to my work. It's a really American thing to say. Um, right? I go to the secondhand stores and I buy what's available. I can't buy what doesn't exist. I have to buy what I find. And interestingly enough, when you go to secondhand stores, you get a really incredible view of Americana from say my grandmother's, my grandmother's house, your grandmother's house in America. And what you find is a lot of funky looking little ceramic figurines 
uh, including Greek gods and a lot of stuff that looks like something out of Cinderella. Like a lot of stuff that looks like something out of Cinderella. And I don't, so I don't have a choice. So there is no, in, there is no intention there because I can't control it. Uh, and so I allow the audience to have the full intention. They provide intention to the work. They, their interpretation tells me what the work means and what the work is really about. Um, Cause you asked about intention. Do I have a, am I, am I focused on an intention with this? And it's different than painting an object. It's different than uh, uh, writing a script and producing a film that you have control over. A lot of what I do, I have no control over in so many ways. Um, I mentioned a little earlier that um, I was doing uh, feminist uh, work, uh, spiritual feminist work using, I was making a fantastic realism landscapes before this portfolio happened. And I did a whole series for about 10 years on women, specifically on women and images of women, uh, paintings and works on paper in the 90s. And um, I began the process by asking a question, uh, which was I had seen many shows using the, what they called uh, pre-production work in museums around the United States when I was traveling. And I asked myself, what would these kinds of objects look like from my cultural point of view? And it took me five years from asking the question to finally come up with Make Them All Mexican, which was the little salt and pepper shakers I talked about earlier. So the only intention really in this particular point was an autobiographical intention. Uh, you know, what would repurposed work look like from my, from my personal experience? And um, I said earlier too, that I've dedicated 40 years of my life to Latinismo, Chicanismo and Indigenous America in, in, in ways that have changed me as a person, that have changed me as a human being have changed me as a woman and as a mother and as a grandmother to let you in on my private story. And all of a sudden, when I said I could paint them all brown, good God almighty, you know, good God almighty, I could paint them all brown. I'm sure I said an explicative. It wasn't as clean cut as that. I was in shock when I said it. And then just to dive right into it, really didn't have an intention. It was kind of like I found, I found an image uh, that appeared to be, um, I say the word gold mine, but there's no real money involved with this because images of Latinismo in the United States really, there's not a big market on this for this kind of socio-political stuff right now, interestingly enough. Um, so my intention is really from the, I don't want to say arbitrary, but it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like a, a, you know, spin a wheel and an answer comes up, a spin a wheel and an image comes up uh, and, um, uh, when I started the brown dots, I just started putting dots up and suddenly they became uh, what uh, indigenous tapestries. They became, they looked like uh, aerial views of, uh, uh, you know, Renaissance plazas, uh, just about anything happened. So even that in itself was sort of a surprise and an arbitrary, an arbitrary finding, artistic finding or understanding or the image appeared. And I said, oh, good God almighty, look at that. So uh, with intention, I rather would give the intention and the meaning of the work to the viewer because I, I consider it to be more interesting. Uh, my autobiography is nice for me to know, but you know, it's not, it's not as interesting as you all's, that's for sure. Well, I think we all know that's not true, but we won't press you on it today. We'll let you save that for your memoirs, um, which are gonna be good. Um, Layla, please um, come on up and let us know um, your thoughts on this part of the conversation. And then um, we'll check in with the audience and check in with each other and everything. But Layla, I'm so interested to hear your point of view on this part of the conversation. Thank you. Well, it's hard to be not uh, all over the place, like my mind brain. I hope I can be as cohesive and coherent as all of you <laughs> putting your ideas together, but I can, I can feel so many similarities, like really feel them, you know, like growing up, uh, studying as, a, as, a, uh, as an artist, uh, learning from all these uh, male perspective and point of view and really rebelling to that from the beginning. And I think something that Amalia says is true for all of us, like, like of course you are angry, <laughs> But it's a good angry, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know that something is 
is very uh, wrong and, it, and something is silenced and you and you really it, I think it's hard it, personally for me was something that was more uh, progressive not as uh, you know I, I wasn't super clear from the beginning I knew the context I was coming from a very conservative very male oriented uh, co uh, yeah machista place uh, but but I had some very good examples from women artists like this. I have Beatriz Gonzalez as Doris Salcedo, these giants as a, as a immediate reference, but so many more. But it was hard to find them when I was studying and growing up. I started to look for references. It was they were not the the, the examples that I was, uh, you know, that the teachers were showing me. It was hard to, to find uh, the conversation and to not sound crazy or hyper angry and uh, to really crave for your own voice. No, I, I felt that a struggle, but I felt also the strength of, uh, um, there's, there's something very interesting about the, 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 the poetics and, the, and things that are not so direct. No, like when you start, uh, when you learn from all of these, feel it all the time in your context and then it comes out in the work maybe not um, explicitly or you know in a super uh, pamphletary way but more with subtleties and at, at some point I was angry because I, I I needed my work to be maybe more more fighty no more more Mm, I don't know how to say it, but yeah, maybe more more expressive, more. Uh, I was working with architecture, and all my reference were ruins and destruction. Uh, so so I was, but but here is the body, here is the skin, here is the 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 woman, here is the house. There's all these domestic issues. There there were again so many layers to these to these things I was reading in the architecture and especially architecture in ruins. So I guess I, I, I started to let go and by intuition learn and read from these places that were in ruins, what, what is happening. And when you start concentrating on, on this apparent superficial uh, aspect of something, but you start to really read and go through the through what these layers of time try to try to hide, uh, you start discovering all our scars as society. I I guess I no me conforme con eso. How do you say? Uh, it was I guess I I guess it was my way. No no, uh, it was not my body, my ex personal experience. But what I found was that. Uh, the failure in infrastructure, the failure in constructing a society, the failure in in our weaving together. We are such a broken society. The Colombians have suffered so much uh, that that I think um, these surfaces are so telling. You no, know? like when you start portraying them and presenting them, because it's not representation; it's presentation putting forward these, um, these scars. Uh, you're talking to, uh, to, to multiple levels of, of the problems of, of, of a society. And I guess that was the contribution that was, that, that was the, or that keeps being the, the, the way of, of talking about it, of the colonializing the gays and, and, yeah, the constructing is this male constructed world. No, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> all of that so much. And I think, you know, there is something again with, you know, architectural ruins that speaks to both a structure that endures for centuries or millennia, even though it's falling apart at the same time. And I think that's part of exactly what you said about the poetry aspects of that. And it's very easy to understand a piece of architecture as a metaphor 
for a family or a society or a body. And so I think that idea of something that endures even while the elements are kind of coming at it and drag, you know, tearing it apart, but it stands. And that there's also something where we, we have a romantic idea about that when actually the experience of a crumbling house is not particularly romantic. And yet we think about the past. And so it's a very, for such a sort of straightforward symbol, it actually contains so much to think about um, and so much symbolism and so much memory in a site like that. So I, I love that work. I think it's really beautiful. And actually that's a really nice lead in to, we have a question from the audience, which is a brilliant question. It was on my mind too. And I'm so glad someone asked it. So Joe Parker, I see you and thank you for your question. It's in the Q and A. And um, he says, um, I'm assuming it's he, a great presentation today. I agree. Very rich work you are all doing. I agree. And his question is, can you discuss any feminist writing in Spanish or English or indigenous activists that have inspired your work or challenged your assumptions? And thank you very much, he says. And I agree. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, just my two cents. I do think that for whatever reason that um, written art, literature, and poetry from uh, the from the southern western hemisphere has actually in a lot in many ways had a larger profile in American culture um, that the vi you know that visual art is in some way catching up to and you know for example everyone I know is currently finally obsessed with Clarice Lispector myself included and uh, right and you're all laughing because you're like yeah we know we've been knowing but you know welcome to the Clarice Lispector party American feminists but um, nevertheless you know there, there there is a body of understanding of poets and writers from Cuba and South America and Mexico um, that maybe is a, lar a larger scale than our familiarity with visual artists. And I, I think that's a fantastic uh, question, Joe. Thank you for that. And anyone who'd like to answer that, any and all, um, I know that, that I would love to hear that too. Writers or activists, which in so many cases in the literary traditions we're talking about are the same. Sandra, yes, please. In my particular experience, uh, I think I'm I'm have been more more influenced for art itself and artists and poetry than for the theory. And I, for liter as I say, literature has been very important for me. Uh, uh, poetry specifically, like uh, Anne Sexton, uh, Sylvia Plath. Alfonsina Storni, uh, Dulce Maria Loina that, that I already mentioned. Uh, and I think my idea of uh, how women relate to creativity and to her, her own body came more, more from, from this uh, uh, reference than, than from the theoretical. No, I love that. Thank you. Because you calling out Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath, sort of like it, it, it makes me feel good about my theory that woman being a woman is actually the, the more exciting common ground than necessarily <laughs> um, other aspects of identity. And of course, we're here to celebrate Women's History Month. So let us have that, everyone. Um, <laughs> um, Amalia, did you have something you wanted to add to that, please? Um, yeah, I um, I would like to say that m most of my work has been inspired as well as for by women artists, but there has been very important literary groundstones. One is, uh, of course, Clara Suspector, and um, uh, but there's a Spanish philosopher called Maria Zambrano who. 
um, has written, uh, she was at the beginning of the century. She was from Spain, but she lived in exile so for many years. So I think it's the first case she, she has a book specifically on exile that has been very important for me in this part of the process in which I, for political reasons, I have not been able to return to my country. And then I took other decisions, but um, the work of the poetic works of uh, Alejandra Pizarnik, of Victoria de Stefano in Venezuela, uh, Ana Teresa Torres, also from Venezuela, who are poets, Veronica Yafe, that have been building and, and from invisibility threading the fungi that Veronica was speaking earlier, you know, helping and sustaining somehow the field for us to, to, became, to become firm. And, and, and I think, and there's this uh, Chilean artist that uh, I really like, and he's an in, indigenous activist, his name, I just forgot it, but I'll, it will come back in a minute. Sebastián Calfuqueo, who is a Chilean indigenous activist uh, from the, um, and he has a very impressive body of work. And there's also another Chilean artist that is working in, in very interesting topics around womanhood, which is Janet Toro. So yeah, um, there's many people that we could list uh, that have been truly inspiring and grounding. Thank you so much for that. Um, Linda and then Veronica, and then we'll see where we are because unbelievably we've already been talking for more than an hour and I don't know about you, but I could literally do this all day. So uh, we won't, don't worry, but I could. Uh, Linda and then Veronica, <laughs> thank you. Well, interestingly enough and contrary to popular opinion, the Indigenous culture in the United States is alive and well and working very hard. And um, beginning in the uh, mid 1960s, uh, uh, Indigenous people from uh, Mexico and uh, California and Arizona and uh, South Dakota, especially, and also the New York area with the Mohawks. I mean, there's many different tribes have come together to create a community, uh, what I'll coin as all nations community and uh, uh, one of the reasons, because the question asked about activists, indigenous activists, there are many indigenous activists in the United States that are working on behalf of the elderly and children and also uh, environmental rights and human rights. And uh, one of the beautiful things about it, especially considering our conversation today is that in indigenous circles, women are easily considered leaders and allowed to speak and allowed to plan and allowed to participate at very high levels. This goes back uh, to you know, matriarchy societies that saw women differently than patriarchal societies and colonialist societies, how women were relegated to positions that were fighting to, you know, struggling to get out of now. And it's one of the reasons that I was very attracted to the indigenous communities because I could speak my mind. I could speak my mind and participate in process. So I have been deeply moved and uh, inspired by and ins uh, by indigenous uh, communities throughout the United States for since I uh, since I became involved in about 1980. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And you know, like note to self, like the next time we have a conversation about this, we can also talk about how you know. Um, the conversation about the indigenous community in America is obviously every bit a conversation about colonialism. It's just that because of how history subsequently un, you know, went, um, they're still at this moment living under colonial rule. If you wanna be like that, right? That's kind of the reality. And that dynamic has played out differently in every nation that's been touched by that um, colonialist empirical um, force. And perhaps because in America, they were people fleeing the government, it wasn't framed as empire, but what else was it? And so I think, you know, I love, Linda, I really appreciate that um, bringing those two ideas together. I think in a context of the, of the narratives that are happening today is so crucial to an understanding of what that is uh, globally as well. Uh, people, and we don't like to think of ourselves as a colonial power, but 
uh, we kind of need to. <laughs> so yeah, I really, really appreciate uh, appreciate that. And, and again, the question was so wonderful that allowed us to make that connection. Um, Veronica, please, I know you've yes. been waiting, thank you. Um, more than reading so much about people outside my country, I've been following the steps of the people that are really here with a throat like this. And there's a lot of women in communities, indigenous women that are really admirable. And they might have not written a book or a big thing, but they've come a long way in many ways, even to support themselves and make a difference in the community. And that was I really live this here and I go to the lake or I go here and I see this changing a little bit. And I think they deserve more my attention because it's really the real thing here for me still. You know, it's like, and that mycelium and talking to them and some don't speak Spanish, they speak idiomas, like, um, you know, different uh, dialects. And it's amazing how we're having more people, more people, not only in the city, but in the towns. So I really admire that they're getting recognized in different leaderships. And that's really, for me, it's more important that, than, really, uh, than mentioning a famous writer or something like that, because we don't still have her here. <laughs> that's my point of view. No, I love that, thank you. And I think, you know, that, I mean, you know, that sort of agency of, so it, maybe it'll be you who ends up elevating those voices, right? And it's through you. And so you're not only creating, but you're also a vehicle and a vessel and a channel for others, even at the same time as you're pursuing your singular vision as an artist. And I absolutely love that. And I would never want to assign that kind of solidarity to only one gender, but I do think that there is something um, about uh, a collective, like the, the desire for a, co a collective community and the desire to reach back and pull people along with you into success that certainly the, the community of women artists is exceptional at. You know, no, don't tell me that men are awesome too. I get that. I love one, I get it. But uh, to my mind, the, I, the history of collective action and, you know, seeking to uplift as many people as possible as you move forward. That to me is something that really belongs um, central in women's art history. And so I love, you know, hearing you say that as well. And then we have a couple, and by the way, FYI for you out there, if you're not in the chat, um, open it up at some point before we close, you know, in about the next 10 minutes-ish because people have been very kindly adding resources to artists that have been mentioned and the spellings of different writers and different people that have been mentioned is all being posted in the chat. So if any of you listening are curious about that, that information is showing up in the chat along with um, a really good, and, and perhaps I should have guessed that Bill Moreno, William Moreno is out there listening, hello. And if any of you know him, you know that he's gonna come through with the practical question, um, really you know, honoring and loving the conversation we've had today and very curious to pick up on something Linda had said about um, the market for the work. And so not necessarily to have a conversation about money per se, but I am very curious if each of you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit your experience um, with sort of like, you know, the art market. I mean, some of you have already spoken a little bit about having projects or proposals kind of shot down, but then seeing the interest coming back around now. Um, how, how is all that sort of going for you, for you guys? Like how, how's the art world treating you right now? Veronica. I'm sorry, starting me again. It's like, I have something to say. <laughs> so I don't want to be left behind. Okay. Um, there's something strange that happened to me, um, maybe started a few years ago, but I think, I think COVID made it like, like, let's get down to not business saying business about money, but let's, like they say in America, you know, let's get down to business. And what it gave me this security of that, what I've done 
this project 15 years ago, I was like even ashamed to go and say, you know, I have this. And they're like, oh, you know, it doesn't ring in something. And now I'm like, I probably have only four pieces left of my own collection. And I would love to, I have it in photography too, but to bring it back and say, hey, now look at it. I mean, I was before the time. So my self um, feeling about myself, I'm like so excited because I know now is the time to go and say and feel secure about it. I'm proud. And if someone goes in, I'll go like, hey, you're not in, you know, it's, it's you the one that's not here now. So I'm really excited for this time. And I, about the market, I suppose it's going to open and um, because it's what's now. It's what's now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, interestingly enough, um, you know, the United States is, has a lot of difficulty with uh, social justice issues. I think we've seen it sort of blaringly in the media over the last year, unfortunately, and the data is kind of there as well to tell us. And I've had some very interesting, and in regards to this particular portfolio, some interesting feedback uh, regarding the idea of making them all Mexican. I think even that phrase alone scares dealers out of their pants uh, or skirts as it might be. Um, I know that many, I have many friends who are dealers in the United States, through, in many different states of the United States. And I've yet to find a dealer who is not only willing to commit to the work and to me and my work, but who also has a cachet of collectors who are, who are interested in buying this type of socio-political statement from a Latino point of view. And I'll definitely say Latino. I, my experiences has been that African-Americans have a better chance with socio-political imagery around blackness, around black and uh, the difficulty that Blacks have inherently in this country. The history is pretty astonishing there as well. And, but uh, you can imagine, then you have Latinos uh, who may be doing socio-political stuff, and, uh, but they're, they're men. And then you have me and other women like me who are doing this kind of work. Uh, so the marketplace in the United States has not been that kind to me in terms of being able to make a living from what I do is very, it's, it's, it's virtually impossible. I make money teaching like many of us do and consulting. I'm even an artist coach. I mean, I do many things. Uh, but curators, uh, universities, museums, uh, small colleges, uh, they love the work because as I said earlier, the conversations are exactly part of what needs to happen in order to be able to change the market. Uh, I've had dealers look at me right in the face and say, I'm not carrying this. I'm not carrying this, Linda. Mm. I like you, can we go have a glass of wine? You're just great, but I'm not carrying this. And I believe that part of it is uh, fear uh, uh, that, the, that the Latinos will come and burn the place down to, to coin a phrase, right? Or that, you know, the Latin American Catholics will come, you know, with their whole church and create a, I don't know what they're expecting. I have no idea what they're expecting. <laughs> I have had the fortune of a couple of dealers, gallerists, I'm talking about gallerists, right? Who do have uh, caches of Latin American collectors. And when that happens, it's usually very successful. And I do sell uh, when I do sell, I sell bodies of work to Latino Americano collectors who have an interest in Chicano art because I'm seen as a Chicana because I'm Mexican born in Los Angeles, right? That's the group that I put into. And, uh, but overall, it's, uh, uh, my experience has mirrored the, um, the reality for Latin Americans in the United States who are making what might be considered, oh, I don't know, you know, sophisticated, uh, complex art imagery. That's my experience. That's really insightful and I appreciate that. And I, again, we can, okay, so then we'll have a whole other conversation about the difference between institutions and commercial galleries, right? So yeah, and I noticed Amalia definitely having thoughts on that. <laughs> so please. <laughs> well, I agree with Linda. I mean, for me, if I weren't an art writer and an art historian and have my little gigs like freelancing, um, it's very hard for me to sell my work. I've had uh, 
dealers, galleries said in my face, oh, you're still doing that body work? Like, let me know when you're not. And actually my work has, in, evidently because the work has its own uh, path in the world, it's, we're just kind of shamans for it. But um, my work has shifted and still I, I am not able to pay my bills through my work. I, I do make, spend a lot of time writing grants and especially this past year because COVID and I have not had work and I teach little workshops here and there and I do, and I write for some magazines, but when you, you know, uh, Shana, how much you get paid for writing in magazines. So it's basically because I like to do it uh, more than, uh, and because we are displaced, this is a reality. We are displaced from our countries of origin. We have uh, dealt with, I have this feeling of being permanently considered um, I mean, technically we're mid-career artists, but we're consider considered emerging artists because you're always arriving somewhere and your work needs to be understood and sink in. And, and Miami being a very open a place is, uh, um, my experience has not been as easy until the recent years. Like for me to have shows and participate in the conversations it has been good in terms of artists, but not in terms of, you know, salesmen, sales or museums, institutions. Curators also don't do their work very well. You know, they should be looking, who, who lives in my city? Uh, I am, I, I, I don't know if other artists go knocking on curators doors, but I'm definitely busy trying to make my life. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, fortunately, we definitely don't have that problem, at least at one museum that we know of. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Ola, right? Just to say, like, the work, I mean, for those of you, I mean, and a lot of you have obviously spent time, including going to school in Los Angeles, but just to say, like, um, you know, this, what MOLA has done and has accomplished in terms of focusing the attention on the power of these voices is... I can't imagine the Los Angeles landscape without it, right? And and like light years ahead of some of the more supposedly mainstream or even self-described encyclopedic museums, you know who you are, LACMA, that it definitely took a while to get, you know, there's there's sort of a catching up. And so I think like, you know, it's it's so important um, to have institutions like that that are also leading the way uh, as well. So just a little bit of a MOLA appreciation moment yeah. there, but I absolutely hear you. Like, but you know, true. even with within some of that, it sounds like the institutional curators are a little bit clued in, more clued into the value than a lot of the commercial marketplace, which, okay, <laughs> I, you know, let's get that tightened up though, you know, commercial galleries, like let's, you know, I, I, I hope that that changes. Um, obviously it deserves to change. Um, Sandra, Leila, before we start to wrap it up, I wanna make sure that you both have a chance to weigh in um, and anything you'd like to share on this or any topic um, before we start to say good afternoon. No, I just, I, I think the same. I think living from the arts is very difficult it's a total challenge to, to, and very insecure also. Sometimes you have like good moments and other times you don't have. And it's a, I, 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 have, I have had plenty of exposures uh, uh, through my career since 30 years ago, I have been working uh, and really have participated in many good exhibitions, biennials, I have my work uh, situated in good collections in museums, but at the same time, is uh, commercial is commercial is very very difficult. And in Miami, I agree with Amalia, it's very difficult to get access to to the collectors, to the curators, and and I think also when we made a work that is thoughtful and that have to do with social and political reality, it's even harder because it's not everybody uh, wants to live with this kind of war. And so that's why sometimes we are in a more difficult position, but I think it's, we have the best profession because we love what we, do, what we do. And while we can continue to do it, I think it worked completely. 
it's, it's a, a life decision, it's a life commitment. And I really uh, feel lucky to be an artist. Thank you for that. And well, actually, I'm kind of glad, Leila, that you're last because we had a specific question come in wanting to know about the situation in Bogota, so. Yeah, <laughs> well, if you're hurting in North America, you cannot imagine here. We don't have institutions. We have a very little art market. Uh, there's something very interesting is starting to happen that unfortunately the pandemic uh, delayed, I guess. But the strength is there. Usually when you just have to make art and do what you do, you come together as artists and there are a lot of uh, art, art independent spaces and, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to do it because it's not a, selling your work, it's not gonna make it. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, another note of appreciation to Mola as well because I'm in this collection thanks to, um, to a very surprise award that uh, happened in 2008, I think. I, they were given this award by, and, I, and I, I'm part of the, of the collection thanks to the MOLA award. But when, when it arrived, I was very little, very unknown, starting up, and it was so important to me. So I, I, I am very envious of this, uh, of this community that surrounds the museum. And, um, but I, also studying in California, I feel like I still have, you know, some threats pulling me there all the time. So Mola is always, it has been there uh, from the beginning, creating these links uh, that should happen more often between South, North, Central America, no? Because we share so much. So yeah, just thank you Mola again <laughs> for, yeah, for it. Thank you for that. And I like, this is the perfect example of that, right? Because it's a conversation that's literally happening like in the diaspora, right? Like this is what that looks like. This group of, you know, take a screenshot. This is a global community <laughs> sitting in front of you right now. And I, the power of that I think cannot be understated. So, um, and then, you know, to have the double power of it being a community of women is just, you know, this is why I do what I do, right? Because of moments like today. So I'm so honored that you trusted me with the conversation today. Oh, Linda, you are my favorite person. I can't stand it. Um, I absolutely, love, I absolutely love that woman. I do. Um, thank you all. God. Okay, so um, I know that we have Solimar and Jorge and Gabriela who've been, you know, quiet during our conversation today. Um, I know that we've already gone a little bit past time, but you know, so what? It's Sunday and these things are important. So I really, really wanna thank you for having me and each and every one of you, Veronica, Linda, Amalia, Sandra, Leila. I mean, I'm your, I was already a fan. Now I'm a super fan. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And, and thank you to Mola for ha creating this event and also for such a brilliant exhibition, um, mm -hmm. speaking to their own message and their own mission, as well as the opportunity of Women's History Month. So um, just thank you and congratulations to everyone involved in putting this uh, together. Thank you for supporting women artists. Thank you. Yes. For yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mola. Thank you, Mola. Let's yeah, all get and, together uh, someday. I hope so, in a physical place. <laughs> yes. Come to LA, everybody. Yes, yes, please. I will. Take I will there. go to your house, Linda. Yeah. Yeah. Linda has plenty of room. We are all invited to her house. I'm just yes. putting that out there. We'll do, a special, we'll do a special <laughs> gathering. We'll do a special gathering. I would love to host you all. Oh, I'm going to Thank Miami you. after the 25th. So I'll let you know, girls in Miami. Miami. Maybe okay. we all get a coffee. <laughs> Stop, right. off at, stop off in LA. Let me treat yes. you. That's the next trip. But then you well, come. You know, <laughs> supporting artists, but also accolading and celebrating together. Yeah. Thank you so much, you of so Solimar, much. for helping us. It's just beautiful to be together in yeah. such a way. I'm, I'm, I have chills. I'm so happy. Yeah, we need this circle of women artists. Yes. It's power. 
Yes. And it, 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 it's been an honor for us. And again, even though we don't see her face, thank you to Gabi Urtiaga for putting this together. It certainly mm -hmm. has been a pleasure um, hearing all of you speak. Shayna, absolutely amazing as a moderator. Thank you so much for your time. And to everybody, thank you again. Um, make sure you visit the, the virtual exhibition. Like mm -hmm. I mentioned, as soon as we're ready to open up, um, we will also be showing her land on site at MOLA. So if you're in Long Beach in California, yeah. feel free to drop by. We will let you know. We will keep everybody yes. um, in the loop. Obviously, our, our online programming will not go away. So we will, we will reconfigure what the new normal is to also include um, more of these discussions where we can bring together um, more of us. So again, thank you everybody for your time. Can't thank you enough. Thank you for all the attendees um, for great questions and being so engaged. Um, hopefully we will see you back again with more programming coming up and be also um, in the loop with the MOLA Zoom project. Um, so that's something that we have in YouTube right now. We keep developing constantly. So more curatorial content that's available online. So again, thank you so much. Okay. And thank I you. think we're... We're, we're just full of grat gratification and gratitude. Yes. Have a good day, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.